There was one that I had a real internal debate on during the show. There was a sign in the front row that was being held by an Asian male. And it was holding up a very simple sign that said, I'm Asian. And I was thinking to myself, I was like, I really want to say that's offensive, but it's not. Like, it's an Asian college student holding up a sign that says, I'm Asian. So, so we ended up taking it. The kid loved it. The next week, wherever we go, another Asian person front row. I'm also Asian. Uh, we show that. Two weeks later, we're somewhere. There's a, a white kid in the front row with a sign that says, I'm Caucasian. Several years ago, a friend asked me to autograph a copy of Those Guys Have All the Fun for his grandmother, who he said was still a doting fan of ESPN at the age of 81. When I asked him how much time she spent watching the network, he said, actually, she only watches college game day on Saturday mornings. Turns out Granny rarely even hung around to watch the games themselves. She preferred seeing the various college campuses, the crazy signs, the interactions between the game day regulars, and all the other attendant hoopla. Note to programming file. If you've got a sports show that's watched by people who don't care much about sports, you've got a real winner on your hands. The trick, of course, is getting there. For the uninitiated, College Game Day is ESPN's college football pregame show, which first aired in 1987 as a half-hour in-studio production originating from the network's headquarters in beautiful downtown Bristol, Connecticut. This past season, over the course of 14 regular season Saturday shows, College Game Day averaged 1.84 million viewers, roughly the same as it had over the past several years. For context, ESPN's NFL Countdown, their signature Sunday morning pregame show, was down 17%. Welcome to Origins Chapter 2, ESPN, Episode 3, College Game Day, otherwise known as How and Why Is This Freaking Show Still on the Air? Let's light her up with Mr. College Game Day himself, 82-year-old crazy man Lee Corso. Corso was born in 1935 in Lake Mary, Florida, grew up playing football, and studied physical education at FSU. In 1958, he became the quarterback coach for Maryland, in 1966, the defensive backs coach for Navy, and was named in 1969 as the head coach of Louisville. In 1972, he was hired by Indiana, and then in 1985, he left the collegiate world to coach the Orlando Renegades in the United States Football League. I had all my hands full just trying to keep my job with the Orlando Renegades. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of the future. Because I thought that the United States Football League would be successful and I'd be able to coach for a long time in it. Obviously, it didn't, but I, I had no idea what I would do after. So how did you get approached by ESPN? Well, ESPN, first of all, did the United States Football League games. And they did most of our games. They loved to come to Orlando <laughs> in the nice weather. Right. So we did a lot of games for them. And... Uh, Basically, I was on the air a lot doing interviews and stories, et cetera, with uh, ESPN. I auditioned with ESPN after the United States Football League season ended. Pepper Rogers and I were two guys that did audition together for the one position at ESPN. I did my own television shows a lot for 14 years as a head coach, four years at Louisville and 10 years in Indiana. So I was not intimidated by television at all or ESPN. I just needed a, an opportunity to get in there. And I, I thought I could last if I could get a chance to get in. I was in the original game day show with Tim Brando and Bino Cook. And I joined them, the third party. That was the college game day. It was a 30-minute show. At one time, it was sponsored by Garzilla Beach and King Kong or something. You know, we... <laughs> We didn't have many sponsors for the show because it, it was just a regular show in the studio. Bino Cook passed away on October 11th, 2012, at the age of 81. And I only wish his one-of-a-kind voice and personality were hitting you over the head right now. I had the opportunity to interview him several times, and he somehow managed to be irascible and endearing at the same time. You'll be hearing more about him. As Lee Corso noted, the other member of the original Game Day trio was Tim Brando who is now a well-known commentator for Fox Sports. But decades ago, he was just finding his way down in New Orleans. I started my career in January of 85 doing some basketball. Duke and Virginia, not a bad start, really, when you think about it, with Vital, and it went really well, and Dick championed me a good bit. 
and I started getting more opportunities. I was working in Baton Rouge at the CBS affiliate and had begun to freelance for ESPN, but then I got a call from Terry Lingner, and that's a significant name. Terry was, along with Steve Anderson, Dave Anderson's son, the first two coordinating producers that Steve Bornstein tabbed when he took over. And basically what Terry Lingner had told me was, Tim, you're going to not just be a sideline guy, you're going to be a host. And we're going to do like 10 or 15 minutes going back and forth with the guys in the studio, which included Bino Cook. I opened the show from the site, and sideline guys don't open shows. That just doesn't happen, but I did. University of Wisconsin grad Steve Bornstein came to ESPN in 1980 after producing Ohio State Buckeyes football programs for Warner Amex Cable. Ten years later, at the age of just 38, he became president of ESPN, still their youngest president on record. His years at the company were unrelentingly aggressive, expanding ESPN's footprint in myriad ways and creating a work environment that was downright Darwinian. Could you talk about college football's place in the ESPN universe during the 80s? Well, it was extremely important. I mean, we had a fair amount of college basketball early on, and of course we had the NCAA tournament, the early rounds, which really kind of established ESPN as something important. But I'll always remember college football as being the first sports program on ESPN that could have been on one of the three networks at the time. But I'll never forget the first night of our CFA doubleheader. I think it was 1982. It was a Saturday night. It was BYU at Pittsburgh at 5 o'clock and then Florida State, Miami at 8 o'clock. And that was the first time when I recognized that this was truly network quality events on ESPN. And that was a you know pretty important day in the history of ESPN. Even though it was a studio show, is it fair to say that you guys were always trying to elevate it as, as much as possible so you could compete with the kind of look that the networks had? Absolutely. And also it was perfect for ESPN because that was a show that nobody else could do. The other networks carrying football couldn't really do that. They couldn't get the clearance and the time from their affiliates. They had done it on the professional side on Sunday on CBS and NBC, but that was it. So it was a unique position and a market that was clearly underserved. And so if we could make that the best of breed, that would reflect well on all of ESPN's programming. Steve was like, Brando, you're my college guy. You know, you're going to be a fucking star. You're good. You know your shit. (laughs) He knew how to energize talent and make them feel special. There was never a pregame show for college football. They just basically went on the air. Now, they did the Prudential College scoreboard at halftime and maybe a postgame for 10 minutes if they needed to fill to the top of the hour at ABC. But there had never been, you know, the equivalent of an NFL Today show for college football. So we felt, and Bornstein was great about this, that we were blazing a trail, that we were doing something that had never been done before. Could you talk a little bit about Bino? Because unfortunately, he's not with us. What was it like to work with him? No one quite like him. I think that without Bino, Bornstein's vision of what college game day could be would have never maybe been there. I don't think it would have triggered to Steve to have a preview show like game day if he didn't have a sort of a Damon Runyon, but bigger than life Damon Runyon character like Beans. And I was a college football junkie from the time I was a child. And Bino was in the studio with Lampley at ABC in 84, I think it was. So I was well acquainted with Bino and his history, and I just couldn't wait to meet him. The best way to put it, if you're going to say it in a sentence, is that, and Corso, I think, would admit this, not only would there not be a game day, but there wouldn't be a Corso that has become the beacon light of game day without Bino. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. One thing about Bino, he was the original guy, he'd tell it like it is. I don't care if he made enemies or not, he was not afraid to speak for what he believed in. And he had a great sense of humor. And uh, he was one of the original guys that I followed that I really enjoyed working with because he was really a great guy. And Brando was a terrific member of the team. Steve said, you know, we're going to go to the Orange Bowl. We're going to cover it live. We're going to be doing, you know, the whole week from there, which we basically did for three or four days. And while we never went on the road on a weekly basis, 
every year that we went on the road, and you know, probably ESPN had 25 million homes back then, but most of them were in college towns. Most of it was Sun Belt, the Deep South, Middle America, and that's where college football stronghold is. So when we went to Miami to cover the Orange Bowl and got there, we were immediately recognized, and Bino was like, Brando, Brando, they fucking know me. <laughs> you know, he was the most insecure guy on the planet, didn't think anybody knew him, and uh, everybody did. And uh, once he figured out he was a big deal, then it made it even more enjoyable. Tim Brando stayed at College Game Day for one year, helping to prove again the old adage, sometimes when the Lord wants to punish you, he answers your prayers. My exit from game day was not an easy one. My biggest mistake, and I've actually had this conversation with Bornstein since, after I went to CBS and he was working for the NFL, he came to one of our parties at Bobby Vans, and, and it was a great moment because we had not seen and talked to each other in quite a while. But he tapped me on the back of my shoulder and he turned, he says, Brando, get me a fucking glass of wine. <laughs> and, I, and he smiled and then I turned to him and I said, you know what? I'm so glad that you did that. And I'm here to tell you that you were right and I was wrong and I'm man enough to admit it. And I said, look what that show's become. And he smiled. And he said, I think you did pretty good for yourself, you know, and, and we had a nice conversation and it really made me feel good because, uh, it was a bitter divorce, but it was a lingering bitter divorce because of the way our business is. I was probably just naive enough to believe that if you do a really good job for three years and your contract's up, that if there's something else you really want to do and you think you're better at it, then you all get to do it. And I wanted to do games. I was a play-by-play -play guy that just happened to do the studio really, really well. And instead of embracing it, I was always chasing getting out of there and trying to do games. I grew up thinking the guys that were at the games were the real sportscasters and that the guys in the studio were there to fill gaps, fill time. But that's not where the business was going. The business was changing. It was evolving. And Steve thought the stars would be in the studio, not at the games. And I was gratified to know that he felt that I was – one of his stars, but it wasn't really where I wanted to be. I wanted to be doing games. In 1990, Craig James began as an analyst on College Game Day, and Bino Cook left after his mother became ill. Bob Carpenter joined the show before he too elected to leave after a year. His replacement would stay longer, more than two decades longer to be exact. Chris Fowler was born in 1962 in Colorado and graduated from the University of Colorado with a Bachelor of Science degree in radio television news. He joined ESPN as a host and reporter of Scholastic Sports America in 1986 and stayed there until 1988 when he became a college football sideline reporter and began doing features for game day. Going from the sidelines as a college football reporter to hosting the game back in 1990 was a, a rather significant level jump. Could you talk a little bit about what that transition was like for you? Well, it was an exciting transition. I actually was forced into duty in emergency role the year before when Bob Carpenter's wife was giving birth, and he was the host of game day in that 89 season, and, and I was sort of uh, the reporter doing features, and they said, hey, listen, what are you doing this weekend because we need you to fill in, and it was exciting but a little bit daunting because it's not something I had done a lot of. Um, at that point, I hadn't done that much live studio. I'd only been at the network a few years, and the first two were doing a high school magazine show. So my live studio experience is pretty limited. And the day before the show, we had a big meeting. Everybody sitting around, and Abino Cook was on the show at the time. And it made a big show of embarrassing me in front of the meeting and telling me that you're not going to sleep at night. You're going to be <laughs> blanking your pants the next day. And everybody had a good laugh. And I mean, that, that was Bino's way of welcoming me, his tough love. But you know, the point was I really wasn't prepared for it, but the show went well. It didn't feel unnatural to me, and, and when Bob decided to move on the next year, I guess uh, I had done well enough in my emergency audition to get the gig in 1990, which you have to remember about game day then is it isn't what it is now. I mean, this was no coveted gig that people were beating down the door to, to get at. It was a half-hour show, and we didn't have the schedule then that we do now, especially not in that time slot. So it wasn't like everybody wanted to do game day. 
there was not a lot of eyeballs on this show. There was no scrutiny. There was no social media. You weren't going to light up Twitter by something you said on, on Saturday morning in 1990. It was just a very low-profile show. And what isn't often talked about, Jim, is that it was basically on life support. They weren't sure they were going to keep it. They weren't sure it was worth doing. But it wasn't like I thought, this is going to be some career catapult. I, I've made it now. If, God forbid, North Korea were ever to send nuclear missiles Bristol, Connecticut's way, survivors might only include that hardy perennial, the cockroach, and ESPN exec Norby Williamson. Rumors of his demise, as they say, have always been perpetually premature. Norby joined the network as a production assistant in 1985 and has held significant production and executive jobs ever since, including a key role in the golden era of SportsCenter in the early 90s. He's with us now because he also served a vital, albeit brief, role in the college game day story. We almost like killed it as a company. We were doing it in the studio. It really wasn't resonating. And I remember I came in and I produced the show for, I think, two years. And not that it saved the show. I don't want to say that. But I think we stabilized the show and we upped the level a little bit. And it became sort of, all right, this show's pretty good. The first year I actually did the show... It was just Lee and myself. Bino was a contributor. He would join via satellite. But in the studio, you guys only a half hour. You didn't need a big cast for a show that small. But it was, it was Corso and myself. So I, you, know, you can imagine when you're the host working with one analyst, and the analyst has, well, I mean, has, has crazy opinions. You don't have anybody there to counter it. And a lot of times I would have to sort of play an analyst role to counter what Lee was saying. And I just felt like some of these things can't go unchallenged. I say that with deep affection. I mean, Lee would call for a guy's job. He, he wanted Barry Alvarez to march into his team and quit after a game <laughs> because of some decision he had made that ended up costing Wisconsin. And, you know, I, you can't sit there and just let that go. You have to say, you're not serious. You cannot be serious about that statement. And then you kind of get into it. And, and it was entertaining, but there was nothing else you could do if you're trying to bring some balance to the presentation. Now, you know, Lee said a lot of smart things, too. I don't want to make it seem like it was constantly countering these controversial statements. And we would go back and forth. And it was, it was sort of an interesting role to play. And I think it sort of set the tone for you know, the host role for game day going forward, where you're more than just a point guard. You do have to step up and take some shots and give some opinions and sort of get involved in the conversation as opposed to just facilitating it. And that began early. It was just Lee and you. You sometimes have to be the voice of reason in there. What did it mean for Chris Fowler to become host of College Game Day? How important was it? it was, he made the show. It was a good show before he came, but he made it a great show because he was a natural. He got along with all of us and he was professional. He knew how to handle the show and handle the humor, the serious parts and everything. The show really took off when Chris Fowler became the main person. He was a natural. Bornstein came up with the original idea for College Game Day, but its biggest champion was a guy you may not have heard of, which was anonymity by design, a rarity in television. Bill Creasy was a great producer back in the 70s and was actually in the control room the night ESPN first went on the air. There were two individuals who could change Steve Bornstein's mind faster than anyone else could. Don Allmeyer and Creasy, or Crease as he was called. Bornstein used Crease as a consultant, and he would often appear, then disappear, raising questions from many about his role. Why mention him now? Because after years of nagging Bornstein about taking college game day on the road, Crease finally prevailed in 1993, and that would turn out to be the most important element of game day's success for the next quarter century. Bill Creasy would always want the show to be on the road, and it cost an incremental $50,000 an episode to take it on the road. And back then, $50,000 was a lot of money to the money-losing venture that ESPN was. So we had to be really judicious in when we would take it on the road. So the first couple of years, it was you know maybe a couple times a year, and then it was once a month. And then when it really became the cult show that it became, we started doing it on a weekly basis. And I do remember that $50,000 figure, which is amusing to me today, because they probably spend that in taxis and shrimp. The way it really happened was that we were pushing to go on the road, and there was resistance. And I understand that. It, you know, We're not worried about the budget. I'm not a money person. I don't have to justify expenses. That's what management has to do. And they have a very difficult job to do. But we had taken the show on the road to cover bowl games. So we knew it would work. We knew the formula was there in this sport to perhaps make an on-the-road show work better than any other sport. 
The first regular season show on the road took place on November 13, 1993, when number one Florida State played number two Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. That was a secret. That made us Florida State versus Notre Dame. And Chris, Craig, and I did the show. We did it from the Conversation Center in the second floor of this Conversation Center in Notre Dame. And there was about 15, 20 people around us, and that was it. But that was the beginning. Because as soon as if we went on the road, we became an event. Nobody else was doing it. The potential for doing it at a regular season game was even more fun because then you're on a campus and you're not in an empty stadium before the Orange Bowl. You're not on the sidelines where if, you know, a few fans are standing around. You're on a campus and you're giving them a chance to showcase their program. It's many times more complicated technically to do a show on the road than do a show in a familiar studio. It requires a lot more people, a lot more technical expertise, a trial and error. You're going to have mistakes. You're going to screw up. You're going to have glitches. All those things, everybody knows that. And it took a while, I think, for Steve Anderson, and I give him a lot of credit because he was in the position at the time. I remember having the conversation, we're going to do this. This is going to work. This is going to be something that was a lot of fun for the viewer. Before he succeeded Bornstein as president, George Bodenheimer spent many years on the road securing affiliate agreements for ESPN. That work proved essential to the company's growth, particularly the launch of ESPN2. Few knew optics surrounding ESPN outside Bristol better than Bodenheimer. When ESPN came to your town, it really was a happening in town. Off there'd be local press, there'd be Chamber of Commerce luncheons, the affiliates would get involved. It was, it was a happening, and certainly all that press boded well for the company's efforts in, in becoming known and building itself, and, and game day coming to town is probably the shining example of that. ESPN gets lobbied all the time by politicians and conference commissioners and, of course, uh, individual school executives and administrators to bring game day to town. I mean, it's a big deal. Can you give us a sense of what college football was like then? Yeah, it was very different because it was far more segmented, far more regional than it is now. And I think that there was no sense of games being as interconnected as they are now. Sure, the polls existed and it mattered. If you were a fan of USC, it mattered what Alabama did because you can move up in the polls. But there's nothing, uh, no sense back then of the current landscape. And I think that the two reasons for that, one, the internet didn't exist since the information flow wasn't there and also far fewer games were on television. So you couldn't be a fan of the West Coast and know a lot about Clemson. Now, of course, the viewers are far more informed about teams out of their region and that's a great thing. And I think Game Day did play a role in that. Game Day you know, by going to a campus, you were showcasing what's going on in Blacksburg, Virginia in the mid and late 90s in a way that hadn't been shown before. Burke Magnus joined ESPN in 1995 as a program associate and basically spent the next two decades getting promoted. In 2015, he was named Executive Vice President of Programming and Scheduling. The first time they decided to take it out of the studio was 1993 for Florida State Notre Dame. That was the only time they went on the road that year. But, you know, if you track the progression, it only took till 2000 where every week was on the road. So slow and steady growth. 93, there was one show. 94, there was six. 95, there was 11. 96, there was nine. And then by 2000, we had every show every week on the road. So, Chris, I've been listening to audiobooks since books on tape which isn't meant to give away my age because I was only three years old when I started, but audiobooks are the rage and Audible is the leading provider of premium digital content on the internet. Jim, I have to say, I listened to your ESPN book on my headphones. I thought you did a damn good job with that. Thanks, bud. Are you an Audible listener? I am, but I gotta say, if I wasn't working so much on these freaking podcasts of yours, I would have more time to listen. So I haven't really gotten into what they have. Okay, so here's the deal. Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks and other audio products. When you sign up as an Audible listener, you'll get book credits each month for a low monthly fee, and you can download your choices and access them on your iPhone, your Android device, Fire Tablet, iPod, or even an MP3 player. You can even go through Amazon Echo. And here's my favorite part. Audible helps you listen to more books by letting you switch seamlessly between devices, picking up exactly where you left off. Okay, question. How do you decide, like, what you're going to listen to? I'm either downloading a book I know I want to read or something that's been recommended to me by a friend or Audible. Beyond that, they make it easy to pick up within a category. 
So like, for instance, if you want to get healthier, you can search under that category or be inspired, get a better grip on your income, or finally experience some of the great fiction and nonfiction books you haven't had time to read yet. Well, I've got a million books I haven't gotten to. How do I sign up for this thing? Just go to audible.com slash origins or text origins to 500 500 and start a 30 day trial and your first audiobook is free. Once you're an Audible member, you get a credit every month good for any audiobook in their store, regardless of price. And unused credits roll over to the next month. And Chris, even if you don't like that audiobook, you can exchange it, no questions asked. Plus, your books are yours to keep. With Audible, you can go back and re listen anytime, even if you cancel your membership. That's cool, so you could just keep it. I like it. So once again, that's audible.com slash origins or text origins to 500-500. You can do it with Audible. Origins is made possible by you. Who are you? We know that you downloaded the podcast, but we really don't know anything about you. The folks who support this show would love to know just a little bit about who is listening. If you have two minutes, it really does only take two minutes. Help us make the show an even better experience for you by telling us more about yourself. Just go to Listener Q, L I S T E N E R Q dot com forward slash origins and take the short survey. You can also give us direct feedback about the show, which we would love to hear. And as a thank you, you'll be entered into a drawing for a $100 Amazon gift certificate. Two minutes, that's it. ListenerQ.com slash origins. That's listenerq.com slash origins. In 1995, Craig James left as an analyst and was replaced the following year by Kirk Herbstreit. In 1997, just one year after joining the show, Herbstreit was nominated for a Sports Emmy Award as television's top studio analyst. I was so young. I mean, I, I was 25, 26 years old, and I was a business major at Ohio State and didn't really want to get into pharmaceutical sales or medical sales, which would have probably been, at that time, a much more stable and lucrative option for me than starting off doing talk radio, making $12,000 with no benefits. And I was the sideline reporter for Ohio State Radio Games and just did that for 1993 and, and 94, had a great time doing that. And I kept bumping into Jack Arood on the sideline of Ohio State games. He was a sideline reporter for a lot of the ABC games. He'd see my radio equipment on my back. and He'd laugh at me and say, what are you doing doing radio? You need to do TV. And I'd kind of wave him off like, you're crazy. You know, I could never do that. So finally, I just put a tape together and sent it into ESPN. And, and eventually they got back to me. And I started off as a sideline reporter in 1995 on a brand new station called ESPN2 and did that for a season. And that's when life changed drastically. In the middle of that season, Craig James left to go to CBS. And they said, hey, come in for this audition for game day. They literally, Mo Davenport literally told me, you're not going to get the job, but it'd be really good for you to experience this. Just experience, you know, the audition process. So they flew in Corso and Fowler and kind of gave us a makeshift, you know, here's a segment we're going to do. And... Now, as a player, Lee Corso and Chris Fowler, I knew all about who they were. And now I'm sitting next to them. And I somehow made my way through that segment. And I felt like, man, I screwed that up. I'm, there's no way they're going to hire me. And, um, you know, I, I didn't hear anything for a long time. And then and my attorney reached out and said, give me a call. So I called him and he said, hey, they want to hire you for college game day for three seasons. And I don't remember what the money was. And I almost fainted right there in the Detroit airport that they wanted to hire me to be on their show. I didn't even hear the gears or the money. I didn't care if they were going to pay me a dollar. I just wanted to be on that show. And um, I just went to work. I just said, okay, no one's going to know who I am. My idea was instead of hiding from the fact that I wasn't Desmond Howard, a Heisman Trophy winner, some kind of three-time All-American. I was a hard-working quarterback for the Big Ten, but they're going to look at me and say, I don't know who that guy is on the right, but man, he sure seems to do his homework. So my goal was, kind of reaching back to my athletic days, my goal was to outwork every single analyst in television and be known as the guy that incredibly prepared, dialed in, 
and literally here I am 22 years later and I'm still like trying to fool them and still trying to uh, just do my job every week. Was it a coincidence that in the same year that Herb Street joined game day, Lee Corso began his now legendary winner's prediction complete with headgear? In a word, no. By the way, as of end of season 2017, it's been calculated Corso has worn roughly 300 headgears, calling out more than 200 victories as part of his college game day tenure. His overall prediction record sits at 1,100 wins, 582 losses. It was all because of Kirk Herbstreit and his wife. Kirk and I were very close, and, and uh, we sat on the, the stage, and I watched Brutus the Buckeye walk by, and I said, you know, if I could get that headgear and put it on, people would know who was I picking, and I wouldn't have to say anything. His wife, Allison, she got the uh, Buckeye and uh, that next day, I put Brutus on, and the crowd went crazy, and the truck went crazy, and the people at ESPN liked it. And I said, I think I got a stick here, boy. <laughs> and, and that's the way it started. But that headgear is very, very important. I don't ever mess around with that. But that's important that I picked the right team to win that. In 2004, Lee Fitting, who'd been working at ESPN since 1996, and as an associate producer at College Game Day since 2000, took over the reins of Game Day. If the show had a calendar, the years of its history could be marked BF and AF, as in before fitting and after fitting. Such is the impact he's had on the show. Towards the end of the 2003 season, I know that the previous producer was going to move on. And so sort of out of the blue, I came up with a proposal and pitched it to my bosses at the time, Mark Gross and Norby Williamson. Um, why I should produce College Game Day. And I'd never produced a show in my life and uh, sort of gave them a proposal and they somehow bid on it and, and off we went. Do you remember, what was the essence of the proposal? I had a few things in there. I said we had to have more fun, we had to talk more games, we sort of had to expand our reach, and we had to take the last segment of the show and really blow it out. I think at the time we were picking three or four or five games and I said, you know, people are dying for these picks. Why don't we pick an eight, nine, or ten games, and let's really make Corso's headgear even a bigger thing than it already was. Yeah, well, I had to learn how to – I mean, my first thing, Jim, was I had to learn how to produce. Yeah, I had to learn, you know, first and foremost, how to time out a show. At the time, game day was 90 minutes. And the bottom line is you have to get in all your commercial breaks, and you have to be off the air at noon. So the timing is one thing. The communication with the guys – on the set during the live show is another. When to talk to them in their ear. Talking to our tape room and to our graphics as to what's coming next and any changes. But there's a million things going on for a producer and director in a live show that, frankly, you just need repetitions to have a better understanding of doing that. Chris Fowler is brilliant. He could do anything on television. He could host network morning shows. He could host the nightly news. He can call our biggest games. He can host our biggest studio shows. He's a perfectionist. He cares. He's creative. He wants every little second and element to be great. He would challenge me like nobody's business every week. And it was just to be great. Hey, it's too much about us. Let's take a break. Too many yucks. Too much fun. Let's get back to football. Too much X and O here the last few seconds. We need to lighten it up a little bit. And we'd hit a break, and he'd say, open my mic to the crowd. And he'd rejuvenate the crowd and wake the crowd up again. And in a live show, Jim, there was nobody better. I could throw the kitchen sink at him in a live show, and he'd roll with it. The example I always like to use, and the most remarkable uh, example is, we were at a big game on Rivalry Weekend in November. We were in a commercial break. It was getting late in the show, so we had very little flexibility of what we could do. And coming out of the next segment, we were getting ready to touch on the Harvard-Yale game. Well, about a minute and a half into a three-minute break, Sandy Rosenbush, who's our news editor in the truck that sits behind me, said, oh my gosh, we have breaking news from New Haven. And I could tell by the tone of her voice that it wasn't good. She said there's a deadly car accident outside the Yale Bowl where X amount of students are reportedly killed. So I said, get me the story on a card right away. We're doing it right out of this break. It's our only chance to do it. So with about 50 seconds left in the break, 
maybe 45 seconds, I get in Chris's ear and say, Chris, we're coming out of break with a somber story. We're coming right up on you. I don't have time to give you the information. You listen to me. I'm going to go line by line in your ear, and you spit it out to America. And then when we're done, you're going to segue to the game, but just listen to me and trust me, and we'll get through this. So 10 seconds, 5 seconds out of break. Chris comes out and says, you know, Harvard, Yale today, New Haven, sombering news. And I literally read him line by line through this emotionally tough story. And then he segued to the game, which is a tough turn. And then out of that, he had to make another unusual turn to like an Oklahoma, Texas Tech game, I think is what it was, and did it beautifully and did it without flaw. And that moment, Jim, just always sticks with me. Uh, I told the story recently, like some speaking deal, and one of my coworkers went back and watched and was like, holy shit, like just impressed about how smooth and how good it was. If you never got to see Desmond Howard in uniform, go check out some highlights online. It'll be easy for you to understand why he won the Heisman. In 2005, Howard came to college game day as an analyst and broadcaster. When you were a player, were you thinking about a career afterwards in broadcasting? Well, I majored in uh, mass media communications in Michigan, so I knew I wanted to do something involving um, television and didn't know exactly what. And obviously, game day did not exist when I was in college, so it's not like I could say, hey, you know, I used to watch that show before my games and wanted to do it because, I mean, you know, Her Street was in college when I was in college too. So I can't say game day per se, but I knew I wanted to do something in either TV or film when I uh, retired. My agent at the time came across the opportunity to audition for the part, so that's what happened. So anyway, so I auditioned for it, and there was uh, probably about four or five of us up there in Bristol, and, you know, you do the car wash and everything. Have you ever had a player or a coach call you up about something you said? You know, I have Phil Sims act like he wanted to fight me at a, at a Super Bowl for what I said about his sorry ass son, but he, he had the opportunity to fight me, and he didn't throw any punches, so he was just <laughs> barking. He, he didn't want to bite. You know, that I was right in the space. As a matter of fact, I was signing autographs about 15 feet away from him when he was doing all that barking. I put my marker down and walked in his face and told him exactly what I said about his son. And then he just asked me about everybody else in college football. Why didn't I say that about them? So he backed down, but that's not a bad day for me. <laughs> what would you have done, though, if he decided to actually do something about it? I would have definitely defended myself. What started as a small following on the campuses began to grow. The game day screen was regularly crammed with hordes of students waving banners, hoisting placards, and flashing painted faces in orgies of youthful bravado. Action in the background often became as compelling as what was going on on the set. The audience at home always comes first. And to this day, we still have to remind ourselves of that. There's two million, three million, whatever the number is, people watching at home you know, over the course of the now three hours, yet we have five or 6,000 people behind the set watching. Now, at the same time, you want to keep that crowd engaged because it makes for a better experience. The challenge there is finding the right balance where you can sprinkle in elements that the live crowd behind the set gets excited about, yet keep the fan at home engaged and remind ourselves that we are a national pregame show. We're not focusing on you know Virginia Tech Clemson for three hours just to keep the fans behind our set involved. And it's also important to note, and I remind the guys of this, Gosh, almost every week, we can still have a really successful show without a large, rambunctious crowd. Now, does a large crowd and excited crowd help the show? Absolutely. But we can still have a great show without a huge crowd. We're nothing compared to the games, but I tell you what, it has become an event. It used to be uh, we do a show and there'd be a few thousand. Now there's thousands of people, going, and it'd be an event. There's things all being done around the show. It becomes so big, and I think that the people enjoy coming on, being on television, and that has helped us. I would go with the director out, usually just in a T-shirt and jeans. I hadn't changed yet, and we would go look at the crowd behind the stage. What do we got to work with here? What, what are we going to – how can we capture what's unique about this place? You know, it, Virginia Tech doesn't look the same way as USC or Florida or Michigan. So we got to find a way to capture what's unique about this. And I took great pride in how game day came on the air. 
and the first few minutes of the show were important to me. And so that's really you and the director. Like, what pictures do we have to work with? What elements? And then I never scripted it out because if you try to do that in advance, you're going to miss something. There was one at Michigan State where we just, one of those mornings, you know, it it was a gray day. There wasn't a lot of energy. The location wasn't very good. Just didn't feel like you were connected to the stadium or anything. And, you know, I remember students were there. They were standing around in the mud. It was just one of those days. And, and I remember thinking, we don't have anything here. There's nothing to grab people. Well, what I came up with was just, this is Sparta, the gladiator thing, which, you know, isn't terribly original. They're the Spartans. The gladiator was a fairly new movie. And we built the whole thing around, just let's not try to show wide shots. There aren't wide shots. Show me crazy faces up close and we're just going to focus on the hardest of the hardcore who were there and play off of, you know, this is madness, this is Sparta. And I ended up kind of just going overboard and selling that hard. And, and I remember one, I was told that in the truck there was a Michigan State graduate, one of the people in the crew, and he just jumped out of his seat and started going crazy. And that ended up being, I think, the episode that they put in the Emmy submission reel. Some weeks there are some no-brainers, right? Number one, LSU's playing. Number two, Alabama. We're going to be there. But other weeks, there's a bunch of nice games. And the line I like to use is, you know what? There's going to be a bunch of nice games the next week. But if we have a chance to do something memorable, like go to a Fargo or go to a James Madison, like those are the shows that people remember. You know, we get questioned on a Monday when we announce where we're going. And I try to tell people, don't judge us on Monday. Judge us at noon on Saturday. Like, it's not a fluke that the most memorable shows that we have are the ones that are a little off the radar. It's very rare when people say, gosh, I'm never going to forget that Oklahoma-Texas Tech show. Never going to forget that. But they do say, and it was really cool you went to Williams and Amherst. Once again, Burke Magnus. The partnership we have with the schools and conferences is very strong, but there's no doubt that there's been moments, you know, where we've wanted to be in a certain location on a certain campus, and it's kind of either a sacrosanct location or... They just frankly don't want to deal with the damage that comes with that many people just standing around for three hours. It's become a fairly massive footprint when we drop down on campus now. So it's not just a set and a stage and some fencing. It's a lot of people trampling lawns, signs, and debris left behind. So it's always an interesting negotiation when, because what we're really looking for is like the iconic location on campus, right? You know, the easiest thing to do in most places is just to take it, find a big open field and stick it down and be done with it. But, you know, our guys want much more than that in terms of what the visuals look like. You know, you want the iconic building in the background or you want the stadium in the background or you want to be a, maybe on a rooftop at an elevated location. So there's negotiations that happen with the schools primarily based on security. And by the way, we go in saying we will return you know, the location to exactly the way it was before we got there. You know, it's not like Woodstock where we fly into town and everybody just leaves and there's a bunch of trash left behind or damage. So we've paid to replace probably more grass than you can imagine over the years. You know, we do, you know, extensive cleanup. Sometimes we do improvements that weren't there before we got there, but we're happy to do them so that people know that beyond the benefits of having game day there, that they're not going to have a whole bunch of problems when we leave. In 2007, after the horrific shooting massacre at Virginia Tech, College Game Day brought the show to campus for one of the most memorable Saturdays in the show's history. Fowler believed national coverage of the tragedy had missed a lot and penned an essay that not only provoked a viral response on first appearance, but is still remembered fondly by many in Blacksburg, Virginia and elsewhere. What sticks out for me over 25 years of doing it are the ones that were exceptional or different or the move is much more somber or challenging. I mean, we remain forever proud of the show we did at Virginia Tech, the season opener directly after the springtime massacre at that campus. And it wasn't because the game was big in terms of the matchup. It was because the occasion was much bigger than anything else. And, And capturing the sense of community and the togetherness mixed in with the grief They really hadn't come together as a full campus much since the incidents uh, the previous spring. And so we knew it was going to be a powerful occasion. So figuring out how to do that right and how to go from something that's very somber and reflective to something that reflects the energy of a football game was a huge challenge. And I, I came up with just walking. We had a camera just walk out of the tunnel 
from darkness into light in Lane Stadium. And, and the words went along with that, and there's a lot of that you don't wing. Things like that, there's some choreography. You want to think about the words you're going to say. You want to think about the pictures that go with it. And so that gives me goosebumps just talking about it right now because it was extremely powerful. And, and, and you look out and you see those people's faces and what they were going through. And, you know, they were hurting still, but they were also looking at this as an example of the Virginia Tech community spirit. And I, I still, many, many years later, hear from people about that show and about the connection and the importance of that. And, and that's it's very moving. It's very humbling. And another time when the massacre had unfolded at, at Fort Hood and the Army was playing Air Force and there were Army soldiers there with the Air Force cadets and the togetherness of that moment, we had a flyover the jets from the distance and i would just I, I think about things like that which were so different than the typical saturday i mean for me those are sort of the, the most powerful memories so you've heard us talk about how much um, we love our parachute sheets now we've gotten into the towel situation and i have to say they're pretty damn soft they're ridiculously soft or something yeah ridiculously soft and uh i guess softness must be like one of their big corporate missions or something like that because uh <laughs> i mean the sheets were soft but the the towels i guess that's what you were saying before bob oh that's what i love about them i love going to take a shower now just so i can use my towels <laughs> wow there you go <laughs> i'm sure your wife is very happy about that oh she's thrilled <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean and they also look really nice i mean you got to look at your towels all the time right because they're hanging up after after you use them it's not like you put them away so if your towel doesn't look great then it's kind of like a depressing thing when you walk in your bathroom but these are pretty cool looking yeah it presents well in the bathroom when you have guests over you don't want towels up there that it looks like you just cleaned up a murder scene <laughs> so that's the last thing you want. people coming into the bathroom you know they're looking yeah. they're checking things out and these look good so these are turkish cotton towels and they use an innovative technology called aero cotton wow. which allows air to pass through the cotton fibers as they're spun and that's how they get these exceptionally soft absorbent. And uh, by the way, have you noticed like pretty quick drying? Yeah. I mean, that's, I guess that's what the absorbent part is. The air going through the cotton. <laughs> oh, true. right. I forgot. Yeah. That's what absorbent is. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, whatever yeah. they're doing, it's working. Uh, yes. So I wound up going online and they have uh, bathrobes now. Oh, the bathrobes are soft. I got to visit the store. I don't have a bathrobe yet, but I visited the store and I felt them and they are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to visit parachutehome.com slash origins. That's parachutehome.com slash origins for free shipping and returns. By now, you've heard many talk of the amazing shave they get from Dollar Shave Club razors, especially when used with their Dr. Carver Shave Butter. Now, you can add even more DSC products to your daily routine. Dollar Shave Club makes products for your hair, your face, skin, shower, everything you need. They will have you looking and feeling amazing. And it's all their own original stuff. They only use the finest premium ingredients and they deliver it to you just like they do their razors. That means no more annoying trips to the store, cruising up and down aisles, looking at shelf upon shelf of, what the hell is that and what do I do with it? You can use Dollar Shave Club for just about everything. They will have you covered head to toe. And with gift memberships and e-gift cards available, DSC can help cover the names of your holiday shopping list too. We want you to love Dollar Shave Club as much as millions do. So we've arranged for you to try your first month of their best razor, along with travel sized versions of shave butter, body cleanser, and yes, even wipes for just $5. After that, replacement cartridges ship for just a few bucks a month. It's the DSC starter set. Get yours for just five bucks, exclusively at dollarshaveclub.com slash origins. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash origins. Since the 2006 season, when the SEC won the first of seven consecutive national championships, College Game Day has been criticized for an SEC bias. In 2014, Fowler attempted to disprove the bias on air, stating, quote, you don't know what you're talking about if you think it's good to have the SEC dominate like they've dominated, end quote. He claimed that fair representation from all across the nation is best for the sport. With 16 campus visits this year, College Game Day now has completed 343 roadshows in 82 cities in 25 years. Paul Feinbaum knows the American Southeast like Jay-Z knows Brooklyn. And that's a big blast of wind at your back if your job is following college football. His instincts as an interviewer rank him in the top tier of the sports world. And he's beyond mere savvy when it comes to speaking very virally. Jim, I was hired for the SEC network and for other uh, ancillary things for ESPN. And in mid-August, I got a uh, email from Lee Fitting saying, uh, could I be available 
to be on game day for the very first weekend, which was the Georgia-Clemson game. I had two segments that morning, and the very first question had to do with Auburn. And they asked me how I thought Auburn would, would be doing that year. And I, I said, well, probably significantly better under Gus Malzahn since Gene Chiswick was probably the worst coach of the history of college football to ever win a title. And I got back to uh, our meeting room and you know do what all TV personalities do. They immediately check Twitter. And I was just, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of tweets just unloading on me, blasting me, excoriating me. And I realized that I was suddenly uh, in a different universe at that point. And when it was over, I, I was both mortified and, and exhilarated because I, I'd been on game day and I, I just had to assume I would never be on another one after my performance. So anyway, I think it was the fourth week we went to uh, Athens and the question that Chris Fowler asked me was about Lane Kiffin at Southern Cal. And I uh, talked briefly about Kiffin. And then finally, I said, I, I don't you know. First of all, I don't know how he ever got the job at Southern Cal, but he has simply turned into the Miley Cyrus of college football. And uh, I said, and after he gets fired, which I assume is going to be very soon or should be as early as tonight maybe Southern Cal can get a grown-up to be its next head coach. So after the show, again, you look for affirmation. You look for somebody to say that was a good job, and no one spoke to me. It was a chilling experience, I thought. Yeah, I mean, I knew I had made a very controversial statement, but I also didn't realize that Kiffin had been fairly close to some of the people on the crew. So I finally left. I went back to Atlanta, flew home. I told my wife, I said, well, this is it. I've been on three game days, and there's probably a good chance I will never be on another one. And she agreed. <laughs> so I went to bed, got up at 6 o'clock the next morning in Birmingham, and my phone had already had about nine messages from ESPN to call immediately. And as I'm stumbling through my house, I flip on the television, and under on the bottom of the screen is a breaking news story saying that Lane Kiffin had been fired at Southern Cal. And then I see myself on the screen doing the Miley Cyrus take. And I don't know if Lee Fitting felt like if he didn't have me back the next week, it was going to make them look like they had caved in because I don't think he really did want to have me back. But to make a very long story short, he had me back the next week and every other week after that. And on the Kiffin front, I, I later became friendly with Kiffin because he, he turned up at game day two weeks later to give his first interview, and he told me that Pat Hayden, the AD, was having breakfast with the president, and they were watching game day when I popped up. And after I said what I did about Lane, the president looked at Pat and said, if we lose tonight, I want you to fire his ass immediately. Aaron Andrews arrived at ESPN in 2004 and rather quickly became one of the most recognizable and popular reporters at the network and in the world of televised sports. Among other duties, she worked the sidelines on college football games, including Thursday nights. And in 2010, when College Game Day expanded to three hours, she performed anchoring duties in the first hour, shown on ESPNU, along with her contributions to the Game Day mothership. By many accounts, she was focused and hardworking. It helped that she loved the game and the crowds, but her burgeoning visibility fueled new opportunities away from the playing field and it became difficult for her to say no when Dancing with the Stars and other possibilities came her way. After interviewing her several times for Those Guys Have All the Fun, each one of which she later told me she had enjoyed, I was understandably looking forward to speaking with her about her role on game day. Unfortunately, the powers that be at Fox Sports prohibited her from speaking about another network show, and thus put the kibosh on an interview for this pod. Aaron Andrews left college game day and ESPN in 2012, moving over to Fox Sports. Her replacement was Samantha Ponder. Once again, Desmond Howard. Well, Aaron was, um, it was, you know, it was my first time working with Aaron, so I didn't know what to expect, and I didn't know what the expectations were of her for the show. So I just kind of went with the flow. As long as those guys were happy with what she was doing and her contribution, then I was like, so be it. I think that in the meetings, you know, she had some stuff going on, like with Dancing with the Stars or whatever. And so she was kind of into that, that that Hollywood scene. And I remember one time we were in a meeting and she was talking about 
Perez Hilton. I remember looking at her street. Who is that? Is that Perez Hilton's, you know, sibling? Like, who is this Perez Hilton? But she was, like, reading something from a Hollywood website. And I would look at Corso, and at Corso, he would have that old man silence that was loud as hell. So he would sit there, but his silence was, like, deafening. And so I could tell, like, this was working his nerves. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was like, okay, all right, well. Because <laughs> she had that dance with the stars, the whole Hollywood thing going on or whatever. And uh, we talking football, and she's in there on that website, you know, talking about that. I had never, I didn't know what the website was at all. I thought she was trying to say something about somebody who was a relative of Paris Hilton. <laughs> Samantha, in her own quirky way, was a little more down to business because she's not that Hollywood type at all. She is more into Instagram and, and her kid on social media and stuff like that. But she's not trying to follow all the news in Hollywood and what's going on with Dance with the Stars and who got booted and who's dating who. That's not Samantha's, like, M.O. So, you know, she was still quirky, but she took her job serious. Here's Sam Ponder. I didn't watch College Game Day because I didn't have cable. Uh, so that <laughs> that made it difficult. I don't know that I ever watched a full College Game Day. I knew what it was, but I had been working my first year in college. I started working as an intern on College Football Saturdays at ABC in New York and then immediately went to Liberty and my first job was calling games at Liberty. So I really was never around on Saturdays. But yeah, I mean, I I grew up around football. My dad coached high school football and was coached in the Middle East. And so, yeah, I was around it all the time. It it felt just like a part of my life, but I was actually pretty unfamiliar with College Game Day just because I wasn't home to watch it. I got a phone call, Nick, my agent called, and it was all crazy. I mean, I was at Longhorn Network, very happy. I loved my job there. I love living in Austin. I went to great people, and and then Aaron Andrews left, and so it opened a spot. I had met Lee Fitting once at the um, Texas OU game the fall before. I was just on the field throwing the ball with, I think, some equipment managers or something. That's what I used to do before every game, and he came down and said hi, and I think for college game day, they used like video of me throwing on the field or something. That was the only interaction I had ever had with Lee or really anybody involved. I had met Kirk, I think, when they because they started college game day that year at Texas. It was like the launch of Longhorn Network, and college game day came. Um, so I kind of met those guys, but didn't know anybody. Was totally clueless going into this thing, but I. Uh, I learned quickly. I mean, I'll never forget going out on the golf cart at Cowboy Stadium for my first college game day. I think it was Michigan, Alabama or something like that. And it was just a whole new world for me, but it was really exciting. It was the first time more than just people I knew for the most part or people in my local community were watching me on TV. It was, I mean, if I would have taken the time or had the time to sit back and kind of think about what that was, I would have been terrified. (laughs) <laughs> you know, if I was able to see like the scope of college game day and what it really is and what it means to people. I mean, I had a sense, like I knew it was a big deal and a, a huge part of how college football fans get ready for the day, but I didn't have a clue. I still remember just going out on that golf cart and thinking, what are all these people doing? Like, this is crazy. It was, and that was nothing. Cause that was a cowboy stadium, not on a college campus. But it was David Pollock and I at Desen Howard used to do a uh, 9 a.m. show. Before the show went to three hours, we did the 9 a.m. show on ESPNU. I had never really hosted a show. All of a sudden, I'm hosting one hour live, you know, no prompter. It was just, I mean, it was a sink or swim sort of thing. But I think sometimes that naivety and the ignorance really is helpful because I didn't know that I should be really nervous. And I think that ended up helping me in the long run. There were times we couldn't stop laughing. I mean, everybody remembered in recent years the Lee Corso F bomb at Houston when he just lost his mind and just and he was making his pick and, and <laughs> dropped an F bomb live on the air. Red, white, and blue, USA. Ah, fuck it. <laughs> Carl Lewis was our guest picker, and he went crazy. And you know, Kirk pushed his chair away from the desk, and I just put my head down on the desk. And you know, that was, that was just one of those moments where, and that's just not game day. That. You go back to live TV sports history, that's one of the moments of the last 10 years. You know, there was a great moment when at USC when Will Farrell was the guest picker and Corso was had the headgear on. I 
believe he put the Oregon Duck on that day, which didn't go over well with Will Farrell. You can imagine, you know, like what transpired. Or when, when they were at Ole Miss for the first time, and by the time we got there, you know, Ole Miss had been on the hit list for the guys for many, many years at the world-famous Grove, you know, which is the sort of the platinum standard of tailgating. Not only did they get to the Grove, but they doubled down with having Katy Perry as the guest picker, which was probably like the, to me, was the best guest picker appearance of all time. Or going to an Ivy League game or to the first time they went to North Dakota for North Dakota State, the year they went to um, Amherst Williams, which is you know, a Division Three rivalry steeped in, you know, a hundred years of tradition, but still Division Three, which is wholly different than, you know, anything else they ever do. Those are the cool moments for me. You know, I like to say game day is game day because we have no rules. Game day has always been well received and well supported within the company. You know, we were rarely told no in terms of what we wanted to do, is that they gave us a really long leash. We had different rules and everyone else got to play by I sort of look at it like game day and PTI play by different rules. We didn't get pushback from the company if we wanted to go to a Fox game or an NBC game or a CBS game or Division Three game. There wasn't a huge concern about self-promoting because we had a new rights deal or because we were involved in the CFP. And I think that's part of the reason game day had success is because we branched out from that. And that's rare in like today's TV world, right? Like everybody's concerned with self-promoting and promoting what's on next and promoting what event or property we have. Game day was different and the company was cool with that. And John Skipper was cool with that. And John Skipper supported that and pushed us to do that. Now, again, if there was a tie between two games, yeah, we'd probably lean on going to the game that's on our air, but that, that makes business sense. You know, the company invested and still invest in a lot of money for game day. I mean, you know, it's an expensive show to put on. It's expensive to get Herb Street from Eugene, Oregon in the morning to Boston College that night. But, uh, you know, I think the company realizes the importance of the show within the college football landscape, and they realize the importance of the sport. What about the crowds at the shows? Did that change during your stewardship? They did change. Um, but a big turning point, Jim, was for years and years, we set up shop sort of outside the stadium or in a parking lot or some in an area surrounding the stadium. I forget the year, but at, at one point we decided to, you know what, sort of all the stadiums sort of feel similar, right? There's, it's a big concrete building behind us, and it's fine. But why don't we go to the students? You know, that's when we decided to go to a quad-like setting. And let's go to where the students live and where the students hang out. Let's not make them come to us. And ever since we did that, we noticed a big rise in the amount of people that came out to the show. I put on, I think, 279 headgears. I had a, a duck on. I almost choked the duck. I got Peter right after me. And then I called a little guy a midget. I got the little people guys after me. <laughs> and the, all the people that gotten on me have been the, all these groups because I've done something and I didn't really didn't think about hurting anybody. How has television and specifically ESPN's coverage of college football changed since college game day started? If you look in a newspaper on a Saturday and look at the number of games televised from early in the morning to late at night, that's the big difference that television has taken over college football. There's games on you can't believe all day long. Without ESPN starting it, it wouldn't have been like that. Were you stunned when ESPN started buying, you know, rights to these conferences and doing six-year deals, eight-year deals, <clears throat> ten-year deals? Yeah. Well, I was, I was clapping and applauding everything. The more they bought, the more chances I got to be in television. They made different conferences. They started their own networks. ESPN has been unbelievable for, for college football. The exposure has been unbelievable. And it seems to me that they've also really been able to elevate programs. I mean, for instance, if you were willing to play on Thursday nights and yeah. you got a lot of visibility on Thursday nights, it was yeah. almost like a recruiting thing for these teams and these schools, absolutely. right? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Mike Tirico, Kirk Herbstreit, and I did Thursday night games. Then we'd fly in early in the morning and do college game day the next day. And that was tough. 
that was physically very demanding. But it seemed to me, I mean, programs like Louisville and other schools that just were willing to play whenever ESPN wanted them to, yeah. and then they started was, getting national recognition as a result. They were smart, and we used to go to Colorado State about five times a year because they'd play on Thursday night, and we'd go to Wyoming. We'd do all the whack games, and that was uh, unbelievable. And they were smart. They got exposure, and it meant a lot to their program. In 2014, it became time for Chris Fowler to leave College Game Day. It was not an easy exit. Chris had, at that time, had become not only utterly synonymous with College Game Day, but really kind of, you know, I, I think you know that people used to, you know, they joked and called him the commissioner because he was just so much the ringleader for the sport and coverage of the sport. What was it like for you to say goodbye to something that had been such a big part of your professional life and, you know, in some ways personal life, I would imagine. Could you just walk us through that and, you know, what that final season was like for you or final game? Yeah, no, I, I had sort of known that it was coming. I mean, not a lot of people were looped in, but I didn't want to make it about me the previous season. But as the previous season was winding down, I sort of knew which way the wind was blowing. And we, we had done an Army-Navy game the previous year and it is the finale and, um, you know, I was taking pictures afterwards, and if people had been observing closely, they might have figured out something was up, but they didn't really know. So all this happened in the off season, and, and when I went back there that day, it was in Arlington, and I was getting ready to call the game that night. I was, uh, I was uh, in a fragile state emotionally, uh, you know, and I, I, it was a surreal experience to approach the set from a distance while the show was going on. You know, if you can imagine all those years of doing it and being in the, in the center of it, and now... I'm dropped off at the bus. There's the set over there. I can hear this crowd. I'm in the bus sort of by myself getting ready for my little segment and the show's going on and it was completely surreal. And the crew was coming by and, and saying some very nice things sort of one by one because that was their first chance to do so. That's not making it any easier for me. I'm getting like emotional and, you know, went out there on the set and something unfolded that was more or less what had been talked about, but it really was so off format and much longer than I think Fitting expected it to be and ended up being, you know, very emotional for me. It was very nice to uh, be able to voice my appreciation to the guys on the set and mostly for the viewers. I mean, it was that's what it's about. I mean, they're thanking them for being along for the ride and helping us build this thing from, from nothing, brick by brick. And if the audience doesn't connect with it, if the crowd doesn't show up behind you on Saturdays, you got nothing. And so it was, it was important for me to be able to, you know, in my own words, say thank you. And, and I knew that the show was in great hands and the show was going to go on and continue to be a well-oiled machine. I'm grateful that I had a chance to, to do it in, in that way. When you're in a hotel room preparing for another event, do you ever put it on and uh, take a peek? or is it? I do. I do. It's not easy. I mean, I, I didn't watch a lot the first year because I knew I wouldn't miss it. You know, which, listen, I mean, anybody that's done something for that long and you like to feel like you've been instrumental in shaping it you know when you hand it off when you step away i don't care what it is you know you want it to succeed you like the people that work for it. it's important to you not to see it fall apart but you don't want to watch it thinking hey that shows even better now than when i did it you don't you don't want that either so there are some mixed emotions if you're being honest you know for me as great as a pregame show was i still feel like you're setting the table and not serving the meal and and Doing play-by-play -play in my two favorite sports is beyond my wildest imagination. And getting to do championship events in those two sports, that's why I signed on forever, because it can't get better than that. But still, when you watch it on Saturday morning, you know, there's going to be times when you really miss it. And the fun that they're having out there is, is obvious, and you can't really replace that. The hosting that I do now is still fun for me, Heisman, tennis sometimes, but it's not the same as doing game day. So, um, yeah, I think, I think I'll always miss parts of it. The Fowler era of College Game Day will likely stand without equal in the show's history. We saw him grow up on the show, moving from junior varsity to varsity to All-State, and then becoming an All-American level host. What was often hidden or underappreciated was the marriage between his official duties and his emotions. Fowler didn't put those emotions out there all the time, but even when they weren't on display, he had the ability to inform his non-X's and O's comments with sincerity and gravitas. And Fowler was able to pull off one of the great TV host parlor tricks, something Oprah, Tim Russert, Diane Sawyer, Jon Stewart, and few other such experts did. Being demanding of everyone, including themselves, 
while also being respected and liked. Most anchors can't pull off even one. In 2015, Reese Davis replaced Fowler in one of the bigger no-brainer decisions by ESPN execs. Davis had quarterback shows in basketball and baseball and had long been considered flusterproof. Perhaps most importantly, like Fowler, he didn't have a huge ego. He wasn't going to turn game day into the Reese Davis show. It would remain about the game day family, the crowds, and the games. To have Reese Davis be able to step in, who had already been doing the much more modest but not dissimilar college basketball version of game day, to be able to step into Chris's shoes was you know, an unbelievable luxury. And frankly, I can't really think of a circumstance by which somebody like what Chris Fowler had become for college game day was replaced in a way that was a smoother transition to the next person. Reese is so good and and really didn't miss a beat. You know, also key to that, obviously, was the continuity, particularly with Herb Street and Corso. Uh, So that was a lot smoother than I ever would have imagined. And, you know, it also freed up Chris to be with Kirk on the primetime game. Uh, So it's not like we bid goodbye to Chris Fowler in the sport of college football. You know, he went into a different role. Reese stepped in and, you know, and the band played on. Before there was social media, there were the signs on college game day. As an executive, do you ever watch, like, you know, holding your breath to make sure the camera doesn't catch a sign that's... uh... Pretty much every week. I mean, pretty much every week. And, you know, the DVR era has not really helped this because now anybody can freeze on any frame of the show and then snap a picture of it and send it out on social media. And I use the line all the time that, like, Game Day had the first form of social media on television. Like, the signs are the original form of social media. You know, like, my bosses used to tell me, what are we doing for social media on game day this year? Right, that was a big push, like, four, five, six years ago for everyone. It still is to this day. What are we doing with social media on television? I said, we got it, and we've had it for years. Like, what better version of social media is there than the signs? You know, we embrace the signs. I still want more signs shown on the show. You know, we take some liberty with the signs at times. Sometimes we take too much liberty. It's a fine line. But science has just been an enormous part of game day. I mean, we've seen it all. You know, like, I mean, I know this now because I have kids of this age, but you'd think that they spent, you know, kind of a full week devising the most clever ways to insult either the visiting coach or somebody else or a political figure or ESPN figure or whatever it is. We've seen it all. In 2015, on social media, College Game Day shared a picture of a sign that referenced Urban Meyer's health problems. Meyer took a leave of absence from coaching at Florida due to chest pains and health concerns, and the sign had a picture of Auburn's Gus Malzahn with the quote, if this crap keeps up, I'm going to fake a heart attack, end quote. Meyer's daughters and many others called out ESPN for promoting the joke. College Game Day responded with a tweet showing the sign, now empty, with the statement, you never solve anything in the digital conversation just by hitting delete. We apologize. We're going to be better. You know, we recognize it's all in good fun, so it's not like, you know, we send throngs of people into the crowds to take down, you know, offensive signs or potentially offensive signs. But every once in a while, there has been something that any rational, reasonable person would say, okay, we got to go get that and make sure it doesn't appear on or it doesn't appear on again if, in fact, it had made it on. So we do have to do takedowns every once in a while. In 2015, both ESPN and College Game Day were heavily criticized for posting on College Game Day social media accounts a photo of a Crimson Tide fan holding a sign saying, Ole Miss girls are easier than their out-of-conference schedule. ESPN responded to the ensuing complaints by promising the network would henceforth be more, quote, diligent, end quote, in determining which signs would be showcased. Every week, Joe, I can't tell you the amount of time I'd spend looking at camera four and camera five and camera six offline, and the camera guys would be <laughs> having a sign, and I'd be like, God, should we show it or not? And then some of the time, you know, a lot of times you say, you know what, that's not right. And other times you'd sort of say, screw it, we're putting it on. And again, some of the stuff we can't control, like, you know, like they're just back there and they get shown. Or there's times when we take the sign and they're so creative, we don't really know what they mean. And then you read it and you're like, oh, shit. You know, then we cut off of it. How has the experience of being part of College Game Day changed you both professionally, Kirk, and personally? Because of being associated with ESPN, going back to those first few years, I mean, I I would put a call into Bobby Bowden when Bobby Bowden was in his heyday, thinking he'll never take my call. And he would take my call. 
And I'm a, just a Big Ten guy. You know, now I'm talking privately with Bobby Bowden. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh. And he's opening up to me and he's talking to me. And I decided at a very early stage from day one that my relationships with the coaches was my lifeline. And I was going to treat those relationships with the utmost respect and trust. And so anytime I've ever talked with a coach from the very first day I started at ESPN to now, I'm given access because of that association initially, and I'm going to protect that and I'm not going to burn anybody ever. And I, and I, I never really have done that. So I guess where I've changed the most is just being around national championships, being around huge games every single year, being around big time players and coaches, and just going from, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm doing this, to probably two or three years after that, just kind of like, this is part of what I do. And to 22 years later, just taking that and using that in a way that maybe puts me in a position to be a little bit more informed and knowledgeable. And again, I treat that and, and respect that and understand that. I think personally, the way I've changed is just going from going back to the mid 90s my dad played at ohio state he was a captain at ohio state he coached with woody hayes he coached with bo Schimbeckler. he was at the beginning of the cradle of coaches i was a big 10 guy and i'll never forget the first sec game that i saw was in 1996 when florida and steve spurrier and danny warfel and Warfel ended up going on to win the Heisman that year. They traveled to Knoxville to take on Peyton Manning and the Vols. And it poured down rain. And I'm, uh, every, most guys are from our crew were going in. And I was not moving. I'd never seen anything like that. And Steve Spurrier in Florida, the very first series, is fourth and like eight around midfield. And he goes for it, which is foreign to me from the Big Ten. He goes for it in a monsoon. And Danny Warfel hit Riddell Anthony on a post for a touchdown. And that Rocky Top song and all that noise inside Neyland Stadium just went dead silent. And Florida ended up blowing him out. And it was another one of those difficult losses for Peyton Manning against the Steve Spurrier team. And that was my introduction to SEC football. And so whether it's that kind of experience or going out west and, and being around teams like Oregon and USC and UCLA and, and going into the ACC and – just, I've become a much more universal fan, and I'm a fan of the game the way everybody else is. Just because I have such love for the game, I've really enjoyed that growth over the years probably as, as much as anything. In 2017, Sam Ponder left College Game Day to become the host of ESPN's Sunday NFL Countdown. What was the biggest surprise when you look back on your first season at College Game Day? Uh, you know, I've never lived that sort of lifestyle before. I had always worked a lot since I started college, but I had never lived what everybody on college game day knows to be normal in the fall, which is you, you don't sleep. I actually compare it a lot to the early stages of motherhood because I actually got more sleep when I had my first child than I did my first couple of years on college game day. You, I mean, I was averaging three or four hours of sleep at a night. David Pollock and I would sleep a lot of Thursday nights because I was also doing the Thursday night game on ESPN. And so we would sleep most Thursday nights after the game, you know, from like one in the morning till 4.30 or whenever our gate would open at the Delta Terminal in Atlanta, you know, like none of – None of this stuff was glamorous. Now, don't get me wrong. The job in and of itself, I mean, every, you get taken care of. Our security team is great and all that is certainly not a complaint. It's just a part of the deal. And, and everybody does it. I mean, it's a grind no matter how you look at it. And once you get there and you're actually doing the job on the show, I'm of the opinion that there's really no better show, no better job in sports once it starts. But the grind around all of that, it kind of wears on you, and, and that's, for me, what ended up being the most difficult about the job as I had children was just trying to be able to schedule and give that job the time that it requires and still kind of try and create some normalcy at home and routine at home. And that, that was probably my biggest wake-up call that first year and ultimately why it was best for me to move on to something else. 
What would have happened if the Berman job on Sunday NFL countdown hadn't opened up? Do you think you could have continued on game day for another season? No. The crazy thing about this was, I mean, it, it, it makes me emotional every time I talk about it because it was just such a difficult decision for me because I loved college game day. I still love college game day. Those guys are like family to me and treated me so well. But the week, I think it was the week or at least within a couple weeks that I at least was first presented with the potential of taking uh, the countdown job was right after I found out I was pregnant with my second child. And I just remember when I found out I was pregnant, obviously being excited, but also being like, man, I think this is the end for me. Like I, I traveled for two years with my firstborn before she was one, she was on over a hundred flights. She went with me everywhere. She was kind of like a part of the crew and it was exhausting. So I was traveling by myself with this infant, trying to do work. And the thought of trying to do that with now a toddler and a newborn was just too much. That's when I was going to have to tap out. So this job being presented, I mean, the timing could not have been more perfect for my family. And it it was just time to take on a new challenge, but a, a new challenge that allowed me to invest in what's most important for me in this stage of life. And that's two little kids. In 2017, Game Day added originations from three new cities, Bloomington, New York, and Charlotte. So far, Alabama and Ohio State have tied for the most total appearances on College Game Day, 40 each, with the Florida Gators not far behind at 37. With a trip to Indiana in the opening week of the 2017 season, College Game Day went to its 69th different campus. How do you define success for what makes, in your mind, a good show? At the end of the day, am I entertained? You know, are we making the viewer think? Are we making the viewer smarter? Are we making the viewer laugh? Are we making the viewer cry? You know, and it's the balance of all of those things. Are we catering to the hardcore college football fan and giving them exos? Are we catering to the folks that want an off-the-field story from Tom Rinaldi that, you know, you get to know more about a player inside their helmet or with their helmet off? Are we laughing? Is Corso doing something crazy? Are we being real? Right, real is a word we use all the time on game day. I hate contrived television. I hate television where one person takes this side, another takes the other side. We are real. We want to be real and we want to be likable. It's a balance, right? And there's no, I, we don't sit down with a formula. I wish I could say there's a formula that we put into our computer. There isn't, but it's that balance of those different topics that we strive for. The production of that show was unbelievable. I give it a perfect example of that. When Lee Finney came on, we have won six Emmys out of seven years, I think. And we didn't win a single Emmy until he did the show. That is an amazing stat, but it's true. Are you uh, having as much fun doing College Game Day in 2017 this season as you have been since the beginning? I think I'm having more fun because of the people there, Reese and Desmond and all the guys in the show and, and Kirk RC, we've been together so long. It's just like a family. We're at an interesting time with the show. You know, we've transitioned without Chris for the last few years and Reese is doing a very good job and we've moved on without Lee fitting and that's been a challenge. At some point, we'll have to move on without Coach and you know, that, that'll be a really 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 challenging era for the show and for me personally so i don't know where we'll go i don't know what will happen to the show i don't know what it'll i mean the show will still be out there but i just don't know what it'll feel like because you can't replace lee i mean he's he's the best he's a sweetheart as you can tell we love him and uh hopefully he'll go another 10 years minimum to keep going for origins this is jim miller thanks for listening